Snapshot, Meyer was a romantic era composer and wrote almost exclusively for the piano, producing hundreds of works for the instrument. His main body of work includes a number of studies, sets of variations of popular melodies, character pieces, and dances. Regarding this etude, we have another fantastic study in Pinti Dexterity, Alternate Fingerings, Going Over the Break with Legato Playing, all aspects of clarinet playing that are really essential to a well-rounded technique. So getting started, we are in the key of D major with a meter marking of 6-8 time. Given the tempo suggestion of Avace, I would suggest going maybe no faster than 80 to the dotted eighth note. That way the pacing does not feel super frantic and you still have some room to take some liberties along the way. Now before we begin, we're going to want to think about all of our options for fingerings. Just like Scheherazade and A23 and the other A2s before, a lot of Polacek's writing really focuses on alternating pinkies and it's really dense. So we want to take some time to understand our layout our blueprint, take some time to score study and make a roadmap of how we're gonna get from beginning to end. A lot of this goes from left to right, right to left, back and forth very quickly. So unless you're practicing super slowly and you know exactly what you're gonna use, it's sometimes helpful to make some notes and have that guide for you. That way when you're practicing, you don't have to focus so much on the execution and more on making the music. On measure one, we're gonna to wanna to use our chromatic D sharp four fingering as an alternative to the side key option. If when possible, it's always a good idea to keep finger motion patterns limited to one hand, when possible to avoid unnecessary movement. Same idea applies, we wanna use our chromatic fingerings for F sharp, we wanna use our fourth fingerings if when possible. There's gonna be instances where we need to flip, we'll get to a few instances later, but generally speaking, use your chromatic fourth fingerings throughout. A lot of these passages revolve around and meander around a certain note. Sometimes it's just better to use the chromatic fingerings since they are a little bit more smoother. They use less fingers and they're just better at a faster tempo. As I said earlier, there's gonna be instances where we have to flip. Now in measure four, we're gonna to need to flip between the written F sharp five and the E sharp five. Now normally we'd want to avoid this, but since we have to play a longer D five fingering after the F sharp, using the fourth finger will not be possible since the fourth finger would be unusable. The same suggestion can be applied later on in measure 24. Now, as I just said, if we wanted to use the fourth fingering in measure four, that's fine, but only if we had a fingering or note above it. In this case, we have F sharp, G, F sharp, E sharp, F sharp, and then D. So if I'm using my fourth fingering, I can't get down to this D, so that's why we want to flip. So it's all about context, it's all about where you're going to understanding the structure and the patterns that we use with our scales and with these bigger intervals. So always take some time, as I said, to map out your fingerings. Um, unless you're sight reading, of course, you wanna make sure that everything you're playing is with intention and you have a plan. In measure eight, I decided to add a small rollantando at the end of this phrase 
do the repetition of the study, adding some moments like this in the 18th can be a really good way to make this more interesting to play. As a personal practicing strategy, I've grown into the idea that there's, if there is less on the page, that just means that you as the clarinetist need to be doing more to create the music on the page. Just because there's less written, it shouldn't inhibit you from taking musical risks or being expressive or making this your own. You know, try to work within the context of what you're playing and then go from there. Um, just because it's black and white doesn't mean that you have no options. You know, less is more, and I think that as you become more accustomed to the notes, you'll find that you're maybe get bored and want to explore what else you can do with it. You know, throughout my interpretation, there were moments where I kind of pushed and pulled, I added some rubato, I sped up a little bit. You know, this is definitely based on piano writing, so I'm really thinking of what a pianist might do in this situation. In measure 13 into 14, we have an E sharp four and an S sharp four with a repeated gesture just after using the same notes. Now reviewing our options using the side key option for the F sharp will allow us to avoid flipping between the two notes repetitively. Um, you know, as I keep saying, you know, know your fingering options and then choose the best one. Now for this particular moment, we can use the same idea for later on in measure 25. So try to understand a concept that you're learning in the A2, then try to apply it later on. You know, a lot of these themes repeat and a lot of these concepts can be applied areas of this etude and also throughout other etudes in the entire book. So once you master something, try and see how you can apply it somewhere else. Now starting in measure 15, the use of alternating pinkies becomes much more frequent. Generally speaking, I would use the left B and C key to the right C sharp key and vice versa when possible. Personally, I feel that this option provides a little bit more of a compact feel. Going from the right B to the left C sharp is a little bit more wide. It's sometimes for me a little bit more challenging at a faster tempo. So when I'm really thinking of this passage, I'm really trying to be thinking of, you know, really compact finger motions, keeping my movements as efficient and as intentional as possible, limiting the space, lighting the touch, really making sure that my hand position is staying really tight and compact. I don't want to have flying pinkies because that's just going to take away from my ability to play this at a really fast tempo cleanly. After 28, we begin an ascension to a few measures in the altissimo register, or the highest register of the clarinet. Keeping a steady pulse just as before, avoid rushing through this section, really making sure that you're maintaining focused air pressure and no biting. For all instances of altissimo writing throughout this etude and other pieces, other etudes, every word that you're playing, really try to understand the idea that tension is going to limit your ability to play in this register with beauty and ease and accessibility, just as you are in the lower registers. By adding unnecessary tension, the embouchure, the hands, the body, we're limiting our ability to fuel the clarinet with good air and technique. We also run the risk of squeaking, um, we affect the pitch. Um, a lot of things just go downhill. So if something's not working in this register, really try to think about what you're doing with the technique, with the interface between you and the mouthpiece, the reed, your equipment. Sometimes those things can be affected, but usually it's what we're doing so try, always try to take a step back and understand the relationship between you and the instrument, but then also try to consider, maybe I'm just having a bad day. If that's the case, to put the horn down, take a break, um, take some deep breaths. Um, you know, altissimo playing is, I wanna say no harder than the lower registers. What we really wanna do is make sure that we're practicing each day. That way we gain fluency to play with ease every day. So, that means adding third octaves to your scales, your arpeggios, um, thirds if you really like to, articulation, everything under the sun that you can possibly imagine, just add an extra octave, really try to build out those registers, bigger intervals, um, you know, anything you can possibly do to make sure that you are becoming more fluent and it's gonna help moments like this where we just need it to happen really easily. Um, in this instance, within the etude, I think that these couple measures in the upper register are just meant to color the line. It's the only moment in this A2 where we have writing that's this high. So it's just a moment of release for the writing that came before it. I think uh, Polacek was just trying to change up. So don't overthink it, just play it, you know, it's just music and have fun.
In measure 33, this return of the opening melody marks the end of the etude. Now once we get to the end of measure 36, I would suggest taking a bit of time to transition into the final passage of the study. In this final passage, Palachek alters the 6-8 pulse so that we're now playing more vertically than horizontally, more technically than lyrically. Keeping in mind the larger beats, try playing this section with a bit more deliberateness, making sure that the embellished arpeggiations are able to grow and decay without feeling like the technique is overriding the phrasing. In my recording, I chose to speed up a little bit towards the end so that there was a little bit more excitement, a little more finality. If you get more comfortable with this transition at measure 37, you might want to start working at the final passage. That way you can experiment with this pacing as you feel more comfortable. Based on my experience with this study, I find that giving a little bit more push can really communicate the piano writing that Charles Mayer might have written during this time. And I just want to note that if you really want to work on more exercises like this final passage, there's some great exercises in, I believe, book three of the Behrman Method. Um, there's some good uh, neighbor tone, half note exercises towards the back that are really useful for this. Um, also, you know, just uh, sometimes making your own exercises can be useful. Working on smaller movements and really making sure that these arpeggiations are being played as cleanly and as beautifully as possible. Just because it's technical doesn't mean that it should sound hard. We want to make sure that even if the writing is technical, it still sounds lyrical. So, you know, the more technical it is, the more lyrically you should be trying to play it to really get that, you know, that balance between the two to equalize, you know. Just like we're trying to equalize our sound between the registers, we also want to make sure that just because something is technically hard, it doesn't sound impossible, you know. As a listener, it should just sound easy, it should sound enjoyable, fun, exciting. So make it your own, but also keep in mind that if it's hard for you and it sounds hard, it's gonna sound difficult to the listener as well. So that's a good tip I've learned over the years that I also try to continue to really try to remember as I'm learning any new piece. And with that, we reach the end of H number four in Victor Polachek's Advanced Studies for the clarinet. <coughs> Having reached the end of this master class, I hope that you've gained a little bit of knowledge I hope that it helps you prepare this for a beautiful performance in the future. In case you have any additional questions on this etude, please feel free to comment below or send an email. We'll get back to you very soon. In the meantime, thank you so much for clicking and watching today. I'll see you soon for etude number five. Happy practicing and don't forget to hit subscribe on the way out. See ya.